Hi everyone, I'm John C. Morley, the host of the J. Moore Tech Talk Show and Inspirations for Your Life. Hey guys, it is John C. Morley here, Sir Entrepreneur. Welcome to the J. Moore Tech Talk Show. We are, yes, on the second Friday of February. What happened to December? What happened to January? What happened to the whole year of 2022? Uh, we have another great show for you guys uh, tonight. And I think you're going to be really interested to hear some of the great stories we have because I feel that, you know, the media has been trying to get people's attention. Unfortunately, I think they're giving people misinformation. Now, that's not always the case. And they always say, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if it leads, it bleeds. And being in media for a long time, I, I understand that. But I have to tell you, I think people want to read more than something that is just going to be a disaster or something that could potentially be, I don't know, something that's just not nice to read about. And so, you know, what is it that I guess motivates people to want to watch uh, or learn about new technology? And I think it's a lot of things, all right? Um, but before we get too deep in that, I want to share with you guys uh, our first story. Our first story comes to us, yes, uh, American companies are notch another record last year due to robots. So what is this all about? And I think what we're going to find out is that people, unfortunately, all over, um, don't want to work. Uh, these are kids coming out of school. These are people from all walks of life. Um, they just feel like they don't want to work. And I don't know why um, this is happening, but this is why many companies have been turning to deploying robots. Not because they wanted to, but strictly because they couldn't get help. I mean, in our own businesses, I know we get people and it's like an effort to get them to show up to work. So I have to ask you guys something. If, if if you're running a company, right, and you can't get people to show up, what do you do? Uh, robots really never get sick. And uh, the trends for robot production and efficiency is increasing as the labor market is getting tighter each year. Ugh. I, I mean, I just don't know why people don't want to work. I think it comes down to the fact that they might be lazy. Maybe they're waiting for another government handout. Uh, most robots uh, that were ordered last year are actually being used for, uh, you know, packaging and things like that uh, in warehouses and those type of uh, environments. And so, um, of course, uh, you'll see a lot of them at Amazon. That's uh, no surprise. And there are still lots of supply chain issues. Um, robots are hopefully going to make things easier for, uh, you know, putting things in the right spots, uh, helping um, to, you know, basically handle with fulfillment. Uh, and they're able to do this a variety of different ways by sensing, you know, the shape, the size, the weight. And it's pretty cool um, what robots are doing. But my concern is, are we taking away jobs from people that really want to work? And if people really want to work, then 
we should, by golly, yes, we should be allowing these people to work. But if it's a case that people don't want to work, then, I mean, we have to do what's right for our business, right? And we have to keep our business thriving. So the only way to do that is to automate the process. And again, I'm not against automating processes. What I'm against is people that try to automate when we can't use humans to do anything. I mean, I think there's certain jobs that humans don't want to do ever. And so uh, it's great to put technology in harm's way because if something happens to technology, we can always rebuild it again. We can't rebuild a life. So we're definitely going to have to see, you know, what's going on with that and uh, keep tabs. Who knows what's going to happen in 2023 uh, with more um, robot deployments. So uh, Microsoft made their intro into Bing with the chat GPT. Um, not very long ago, just a couple days ago. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting what's happening. Uh, Google is showcasing its own AI search experience. And, you know, the question is, is this going to be the right thing? Uh, according to Bill Gates, he's saying that this is going to be um, almost as important or as significant as getting internet. Okay, uh, I guess we're going to have to see what happens when, how people respond to GPT um, and what it's going to mean for people. You know, it's, it's a new way for people to communicate and it's supposed to give people answers that would be very similar to that of a human person. And if you're saying to me, hey, John, you know, why did uh, Microsoft uh, roll out chat GPT? If, if you're still on the fence about that. Um, so chat GPT is an AI chatbot developed by uh, San, uh, San Francisco based startup OpenAI. And OpenAI was co-founded uh, in 2015 by guess who? Elon Musk and Sam Altman. And is backed by well-known investors, of course, one of them being Microsoft. So is Bing now using Chatbot or the ChatGPT? Yeah, in the latest version of Microsoft Bing search engine, which is now accelerated, the AI tool uh, in regard to a new connection with the very um, revolutionary ChatGPT content generation tool, is now able to communicate and interact with that new uh, source. What is ChatGPT? It's a natural language processing tool that can create content images and even code on demand via conversations with a chatbot. It's an AI-driven tool built on OpenAI GPT-3 family of large language models. Um, and if you're wondering, you know, who is the founder of ChatGPT? Well, again, the um, person was born in San Francisco in 1988. Mira Murati was raised and brought up in the United States. And he is the CTO at OpenAI. And the company developed uh, artificial intelligence-powered chatbot called ChatGPT. Um, but they've had concerns over its misuse. And so you might be saying to me, you know, why does Bing keep uh, replacing Google? So Google redirects to Bing happens because of a browser hijack. OK, it's not them doing this. And it is a type of malware that a lot of people have been noticing on their computers. So if that's happening to you, chances are you probably do have some malware on your computer. So chat GPT is like our latest new buzzword, okay? Of course, it can be exploited and it has benefits, but then it also has some things that could hurt the American people and also people not just in America, but around the country. It's supposed to make uh, life interesting, but it's really making life uh, challenging for people. People that are not technically savvy can get ideas from it and then take them seriously. Um, people that have begun working on this are just trusting it like out of nothing. And I think that's a problem. We've talked about trust on my other shows, that 
Trust is a process. And we can never expect to just build trust like that. We can't, right? We have to start small and grow big. Hey, that was one of my other videos. Start small, grow big. And we learned that in the 3D printing system that, that we used. So start small, grow big. And as you do, you start to understand that your foundation has to be strong. And then you build upon something that is strong. When you do that, guess what happens? You get a stronger foundation and you get a larger structure. Pretty cool. All right. Um, Apple, yes. Apple to defend the mobile payment system. What the heck is this all about? Um, they're going to attempt to defend it at the February 14th, hey, Valentine's Day, uh, European Union hearing. This is what our sources have said uh, from Reuters. And uh, it's interesting to know where this is going to go and what does it mean to not only the American people, but what does it mean to the rest of the country? And I think what we're going to find out is that uh, there have been some problems. So Apple is going to defend, attempt to defend their, their mobile payment system and seek to convince the European Union and the antitrust regulators that it does not block rival access to its technology used for mobile wallets at this closed hearing on Tuesday. And uh, it's going to be interesting to... Uh, get the comments after that. Um, the European Union antitrust watchdog has said that Apple's anti-competitive practices dates back to 2015 with the Apple Pay by a launched uh, application, close quote. The commission declined to comment. Apple referred to a statement last year, which said, and I quote, that Apple Pay is only one of many options available to European customers and which has ensured equal access to its tap and Go Technology, which is NFC, Near Field Communication, close quote. So is this a case of some information that um, has been miscommunication? Or is this really a problem? Is Apple's um, payment system really uh, trying to scrutinize things? So does Apple payment... Uh, block third party, I guess, is really uh, the question. And we're going to have to see. Uh, Apple services um, basically are always evolving and changing. And um, people have found lots of challenges uh, with Apple and their payment system and how it works. But I think the real issue for people is the fact that it is not giving people a choice. And we also don't know what kind of information that Apple's really sharing. I mean, we have an idea, but I don't know. Um, so we're going to have to see what happens with this. And I'm very interested to know what is Apple going to do with their claim? Do they have substantial evidence to prove that they are in the right? Or are they just going to try to snow job the jury? We'll have to find out and wait till after Valentine's Day. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, in other news, uh, Senator Danes was suspended on Twitter for uploading something graphically violent. What did he upload that was so violent? I mean, for a senator. Well, he was actually uh, traveling uh, with his spouse and um, posing with her and took a picture while hunting. And um, Twitter had uh, indicated uh, that his account had been suspended. Uh, so Twitter's profile displayed messages indicating the account was temporarily unavailable because it violated the Twitter media policy. According to an aide to the center, Dane's account was suspended due to his profile picture, which had shown Dane's and his wife posing while hunting. A separate campaign account for Dane's with a similar profile picture was 
unaffected. So was it really the profile photo or was it something else? Um, a message from Twitter notifying Danes of a suspension obtained by CNN showed, and I quote, the company had determined the profile picture violated Twitter's rules against, quote unquote, graphic violence or adult content in profile images, close quote, uh, quote. So Twitter did not immediately respond to requests for comment, as we would expect. Uh, in a statement, Rachel uh, Dumek said, spokesperson for Dane, called the suspension, and I quote, preposterous, and said Twitter had informed Dane's office that the suspension would last until the profile picture was removed, close quote. So, of course, she responded, and I quote, this is insane. Twitter should immediately reverse suspension, close quote, said Philip Letso, a spokesman for the National Republican Senatorial Committee in a statement recently made. So according to an email sent by Twitter, um, trust and safety team, and that would be uh, Vice President Ella Irwin to Dames, a quote, offices had obtained by CNN the company's policy on graphic profile images due to a technical limitation of Twitter's platform, close quote. Quote, we don't allow images of dead animals, dead animals or blood in profile photos because we are unable to label them as NSFW. That means non-suitable for work and keep them from being seen by users who specifically don't want to see images. Close quote, Iron. So apparently Dane's profile had a small animal in it. And uh, appeared to be small, tiny drops of blood on its coat. And it was difficult to discern without expanding the image. And this is why Twitter claimed that they suspended his account. So it wasn't the animal. It wasn't holding the gun. It was the fact that it had some graphic violence depicted in the photo. I get what Twitter's saying, but are we being a little bit hypochondriatic? I think so. There might have been some other reason. There might have been a statement he made, but they couldn't really go after him, is what my speculation is, for that. So they decided to go after him for this. All right, Twitter. Looks like you're not really going to give us the truthful answer. That was kind of like a, just a come on. All right, every single day, you know... Um, Guys put on different kinds of pants and go into cities. And, you know, we really put ourselves at risk because, yes, we can become pickpocketed. Pickpocketed. And so you might ask yourself, how do people pickpocket? So that's what I want to share at first. So um, they don't employ any special way of doing it. They just seek people who seem to be more vulnerable. These are people like college students uh, in crowded public areas, which have backpacks, or maybe they have them off and they're sitting next to them and they're despondent while they're uh, playing on their uh, mobile device. Uh, a pickpocket simply sits nearby and just appears to innocently reach into the victim's backpack. And voila, we have a pickpocket case. So pickpocketing, uh, how do you spot a pickpocket? So there are a few things you probably can know. First of all, watch out for people that make a scene. Be aware of those that try to get too close to you or in your personal buffer, like get past that. Keep an eye out for people trying to make conversation with you when there's really no need to talk with them, especially in a crowd area. And be cautious of anyone trying to blend in. So pickpockets go after things like wallets, passports, and valuables. This is why when you're traveling, I know the first time I went to Europe, I got a money belt. And you basically put the money belt on uh, under your pants. And you put that in there so the money is actually uh, inside the money belt. And you're basically wearing that uh, pretty much against the underwear garments. And the pickpocket is not going to get into that too easily. And so um, you're most likely to get pickpocket according to the national standards. Uh, that would be Las Rambles, Spain, the Eiffel Tower in France, 
uh, the Trevi Fountain in Italy, and the Charles Bridge at the Sezek Republic. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't get pickpocketed other places in the world. Of course, places like, um, you know, you know, you, you've got you've got other places um, that would be uh, very popular, like um, you got the Louvre in Paris, you got Notre Dame in Paris. Uh, you've also got places in New York, like Manhattan. Again, any large cities, you could get pickpocketed at a school. The thing is, when you know the people in your area, that's not what pickpocket is going to happen. It's going to mostly trans bond when there are strangers and when you're at a place like maybe an airport and there's just too much of a crowd that's why if you go to a concert and people are like too much butt together with you you can't move it's very easy so a little bit about how pickpocketing works and i'll talk about this new invention that came out so um first time i was pickpocketed hopefully it'll be the last time I was in Italy. I was only um, just out of eighth grade, had gone down with my mom's um, father and mother and one of my cousins, my older cousin. And we went to Italy and we had family there. And I remember us getting off the plane and um, we wanted to get something to eat. So obviously, you know, I had I had changed. Uh, I had uh, Bermuda shorts on and my wallet uh, was bulging out a little bit of my of my shorts. So when I sat down at the the cafe, somebody probably spotted my wallet. That's probably what happened. I then got up from that, didn't know that, got up, and all of a sudden, uh, these Italian citizens were approaching me. Okay, so this one person was trying to show me something um, in the the Italian uh, newspaper there. And my grandfather's like, you know, get out of here, get out of here. Meanwhile, as he did that, he kind of bumped into me. There was this other guy that also bumped me at the same time. So because I paid attention to this with my eyes, I didn't realize I was getting bumped in the other side and that my pocket was getting picked. At that time, he had stole my wallet. Uh, it had um, basically uh, some traveler's checks in it, which didn't get stolen. Uh, my license didn't get stolen, and it had some Italian money in it. And some credit cards. The credit cards didn't get stolen. Either. They just went after the money um, and the the wallet. So the thing is, they took the whole wallet. What I mean by it didn't get stolen is they took everything. Okay. But when I went to the shop, which was right there, the pawn shop, the kid that took it, he was all his face was all cleaned up. Okay. And he was working for the pawn shop. And then I went there and I paid more money to get the wallet back and there was no money. And so I paid to get the money back. Plus he made the money on the Italian money he stole out of my wallet. He didn't touch my uh, license or anything like that uh, or any of my credit cards, but he did go at, or my traveler's checks. He did go after the Italian money. At that time, I think I had I'm trying to remember how much money I had in there because it was different back then. Um, Trying to remember now. Uh, they called it lira back then. Uh, now they they call it something different. Um, so to give an example, thirty thousand Italian lira is just zero point zero six three six zero two U.S. dollars. So if you had, let's say you had, uh, I don't know, let's say you had uh, fifty thousand lira. Okay. That's still not that's still not a dollar. So how about if you had a hundred thousand lira? Hundred thousand lira? Nope. Five hundred thousand lira right now is one point one oh five two seven seven US dollars. So you might be asking, John, what is the currency uh in Italy? So they use the euro now. One euro is 1.07 U.S. state dollars. So $500,000 was literally just, and back then it was obviously, um, you know, it was less um, for the, the dollar was worth a little bit differently back then. 
And so what happened is my grandfather knew exactly what was going on. And we went over this uh, road and he knew exactly the place. And my grandfather called them gypsies. He said, this is how they operate. They, they take your wallet. And so now anytime on that trip, when we saw people coming to us with, with magazine, of course, we knew the game, like get away from us. Okay. Because once you get vigilant like that and you know, their game, they cannot outsmart you. All right. So why am I talking about this? Well, there is a new technology and, and, you know, and I, and I call it a technology, um, it is, uh, they call it the pickpocket proof travel pants. And it stopped over 60 thefts. Um, and I, I like to call it the, the you know, the CIA, uh, if you will, um, uh, if you will, flavor uh, for pants. And so how do, how do the pants work? You, you might be asking that question. And so um, I think you might be asking, so, hey, John, how do I, how do I even um, prevent somebody from doing this? So uh, they're designed to outsmart pickpockets, and, uh, and I quote, all right? Um, so you might be asking pickpockets versus pickpocket-proof pants. So what the heck is pickpocket proof pants? Well, um, it is a type of pants, um, that allow you to get security back in your life. Okay. It, it takes you only a few seconds long to access your valuables. It'll take a pickpocket far longer and you'll be able to catch them on the spot. Because they want something quick. Um, one of the owners uh, had said that we want to expand upon the concept of people feeling safe, uh, you know, in their clothing and that they're not pickpockets. So, so how do uh, pickpocket safe pants work? So um, the pants have side pockets that zip up and then can be protected by a button flap that goes over the opening. So it's not so simple as to just bump into you and just grab something. But again, you still want to be prepared. Wear a money belt, which you should, underneath, underneath your pants. Leave the real um, important valuables in your hotel room, possibly in the safe. Secure your bag, gadgets, and other valuables when you're out. There's no need to take them. Of course, you might need to take a camera, but now these days you have your smartphone. Be alert when you're in crowds. If you see a commotion, try to steer clear of it. And remember, don't lose it is the mythology you should be living by. Leave a clue for honest finders. And you'll know that you're going to be able to stop pickpocketing. So the idea of pickpocket pants and pickpocket shirts is that they make what the thief is going after just a little bit harder to actually get. And this is the same philosophy when it comes to alarm systems. No matter what kind of system you put in, a professional thief is going to get in. They're going to get in if they want to get into your place. But you're going to keep out the amateurs. You're going to keep out the people that are looking for that quick pull and go. You're going to be able to stop them. And if you stop them, you might say, gee, will the professional still go after me? The professional will still go after you, but he's going to be more discouraged to go after you if there's heightened security. So do they go after you or not? They look at the risk and they decide, is what they're going after worth that risk? Or 
is there something else easier to go into? Like, is there someone's home that doesn't have a security system or maybe doesn't have a door locked, okay? Or doesn't have a pet, okay? Or maybe somebody that leaves their keys in their cars. They're looking for easy prey. Easy prey. Now, when you think about any kind of pickpocket, okay, you might be asking yourself, um, you know, how, how do you stop a pickpocket? So um, it's actually pretty easy. Um, refrain from showing your things. Picket pr uh, pocket proof supplies like shirts, pants, uh, different types of devices. Um, stay alert all the time. Okay. Don't put all your money there. Put a portion of it. And remember to not convert your money. If you're traveling, leave your traveler's checks because they're not going to steal your traveler's checks. They're not going to be able to cash them. Okay. Don't put anything in your back pocket. Guys, ladies, a lot of times people love to put their wallet in their back pocket. And you are a target, a prime suspect for being pickpocketed. Because somebody can easily just bump into your behind, grab it, and go. They don't even have to reach into the side of your pants. Okay? Ditch the fanny packs, backpacks. Make sure the bag is on you and that that bag's not going to come away from you. For example, if you are going um, on a hike. And there might be places you have to go through and you're worried about getting pickpocket or, you know, or, or getting your bag stolen. Have the bag so it's wrapped around you. Make sure your bag's uh, zippers are zipped many different ways. And any valuables are put into zippers that have locks on them. Okay. So these are just a few tips. It's not meant to be the be all or the end all. But I have to tell you that. When somebody is trying to do a pickpocket, they're usually walking low, their head is down, they're looking real quick, and they're just doing it so easily, the person doesn't even know that it's happening. Remember, don't show your valuables off in public. That was the mistake I made, and I didn't do it intentionally. I did it because I was sitting at a cafe, and unfortunately, I should have never wore those pants because... Those pants were showing um, my wallet. And I still remember the shorts that I was wearing. I used to love to wear OP. Uh, I don't even know if there's still a brand anymore, Ocean Pacific. And I love to wear my OP um, corduroy shorts. And that's what I was wearing. And um, OP corduroy shorts are not Bermuda shorts. And so somebody can easily see um, what you put in, in the side. It's obviously not a good thing to, um, you know, to be wearing. Um, again, try to minimize your valuables. That is very, very important. Um, when you're sitting down in a chair, um, don't just have the bag sitting on the chair. Have your arm over it so somebody can't quickly just grab the bag, take off, and be on with all of your valuables. Now, another thing you might be asking me is saying, hey, John, you know, I travel a lot. I don't get pickpocketed. I'm very alert. It can happen on places like a plane. Because the thing is, you won't realize you're pickpocketed until you've left the scene. So you're exiting the plane. They'll never do it getting on the plane. They'll do it getting off the plane. So now you're getting off the plane. People are all hustle and bustle. And suddenly somebody, but, oh, excuse me. And then you don't even think twice. And bam, the wallet's gone and you're out. Now, that sounds crazy, but that's how they do it. How about a hotel? Hotel, people typically check in. Um, their luggage is there. Sometimes the luggage is put in the hallway. And um, that luggage isn't watched, even for a split minute. And you know what the easiest things people pick pocket besides pockets? They take things like laptops because they know they're valuable. They know they can sell them online and, and make a quick buck. Or not even online, they're probably going to sell them at a, a pawn shop because if they get caught online, most people have things that can track the serial number. But then somebody, some people don't. And so I think just understanding 
that this danger is out there. I don't want to scare people and never travel, but you do need to be cognizant of what is going on. I think that is probably uh, the most important thing. All right. Let's get to our last topic for the evening. And I know you're probably wondering, John, what is the last topic? Well, for a long time, uh, you know, COVID had been around. I don't want to say COVID is gone, but, um, you know, people have been meeting remotely. And is the Zoom bomb maybe ending? What do you mean the Zoom bomb may be ending? Well, Zoom is starting to let off people. What do you mean? People are starting to feel more comfortable getting back to work. All right. Um, this is a video conferencing platform that many of you may or may not know. And I'll tell you that um, it's important that you understand the trends. And so uh, it's a video conferencing platform, and it cut basically 15% of its staff. That's pretty incredible. Why? I think people now want to get back to life as they used to know it. Okay. With the drop in 50% of its workers and 1,300 individuals, when Zoom had tripled its headcount two years ago, quote, we didn't take as much time as we should have to thoroughly analyze our teams or assess if we were growing sustainably toward the highest priorities. Uh, quote Eric Yan, Zoom CEO. So I think what happened is Zoom got a little zealous that they were growing and they figured, hey, nobody can touch us. We're going to be the leader. I saw this when they were booming that they were going to go down. I didn't know when. Uh... Three years later, Zoom's um, strong market share is starting to diminish. And competitors like Microsoft and Slack are calling in with electronic mail and many other productivity type uh, applications and instruments. Zoom is an experience, um, but Zoom doesn't offer everything. And Zoom may have to really think about what they're doing or they might be left behind in the dust. So you might be asking me a very important question, which I'll be happy to answer. Why are people leaving Zoom? Why? It's simple. Um, they're facing issues with security, okay? And um, with end-to-end -end encryption, um, it's a problem. People could listen into conversations. And, you know, I got to tell you that everyone was backing Zoom. I never liked it. I used it for a couple small things. But I have to tell you, I see our own company moving away from Zoom. We use Zoom for a lot of our, like, interviews and stuff. But I think I'd like to stop using Zoom and basically move over to, like, Slack or other platforms because they're very secure. OK. Um, the end encryption they said they had, they lied to us. So what are some alternatives to Zoom? So there are plenty and plenty of competitors. You got Google Meet, but you guys all know that I don't like to give everything to Google. You got GoToMeeting. You got WhatsApp. I'm not a big WhatsApp guy. Um, people say stop using Zoom. Um, if you still don't understand, stop using Zoom. If you're only using it for personal game nights, even if you're only using it for your church group, it doesn't matter. Stop using Zoom. So unless we keep tech companies accountable and hold them up to a higher standard, there's no incentive for them to stop using or changing Zoom so we can get a better product. They've already lost their credibility, and until they take 
considerable steps to replace their leadership. I see Zoom either growing or possibly going out of business. So we're not trying to scare you, but all we're saying is Zoom is not secure. It's not secure. I would tell you that Zoom has some benefits. And people say using the password is secure enough. It's not. Zoom is uh, user-friendly, but you're missing the most important point, everyone. It's not secure. If a security breach were to happen or a secure was exposed, that's one thing. What Zoom did internationally was lie about their security. And that, my friend Robert, it is beyond unethical. Do we even want to work with a company like Zoom? Because Zoom is not secure. And will Zoom ever be secure? I don't know. I don't know if we can trust Zoom. I don't know if we can believe what they're doing. See, now people have a choice. And uh, Eric Yuan says, uh, today we're focused on supporting those leaving Zoom and making the transition as respectful and compassionate as possible. Hmm. So it's a difficult message. that a lot of people in the U.S. are being let go as employees from Zoom. The pandemic was a great time for Zoom, right? But they abused their privilege and their power. And with Zoom's layoffs impacting 15% of the workforce, what's going to happen? Will Slack replace Zoom? Will it? I think the big issue that people have is they want to be able to create meetings, but things like, uh, you know, a uh, once hub, like, you know, will, will for example, will, will, will once hub uh, support Slack? Not yet. Not yet. So we can get notified about meetings, but we don't necessarily get the integration of the meeting. I don't know. I think this is a problem. And I've learned that you can't trust a company, especially when they're new. You got to learn. You got to see that they have the proof in the pudding, not that they say they have the pudding and it tastes good. I want to taste that pudding. I want to know if it's good. And if it's not, I'm going to tell you. And you can either fix it or I'll go get somebody else's pudding or I'll make my own pudding. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm John C. Morley, serial entrepreneur. It has been an amazing privilege, pleasure, and honor to be with this fantastic Friday, February 10th, 2023. Uh, by the way, everyone, I before I say goodbye, uh, I want to take this opportunity to wish all of you and yours, uh, whether you be uh, ladies or gentlemen, significant others, whatever relationships you have, a very happy, healthy, blessed, and loving, uh, non-discriminating Valentine's Day. Um, so before I go, um, I want to talk about some tech trends uh, for Valentine's Day. Uh, you might say, wow, what uh, what can you do uh, for Valentine's Day? So there's a couple things. So there is one company that actually makes a bulb. And inside the bulb, it literally has a heart. Pretty cool, right? Um, there are bracelets you can do. Um, 
you can make something like a card for them, right? Uh, there is a dual heart iPhone charging cable. So you plug it in together and through my one heart, we'll always beat together and charge each other. A little corny, but you could put something cool with it. Um, there is a call me maybe uh, case with a heart on it. Um, maybe you want to get um, uh, a jar of M&Ms with the different colors. Or maybe you know what I like to recommend doing when it comes time for technology. Maybe it's you putting in these special things. And in these special things, you could put them in a jar or using technology, you could actually schedule um, some different um, things during Valentine's Day that maybe you want to do uh, with your loved one. And then you could give them this techno thing and it could have everything and it kind of could be like digital coupons, right? I know that's a little elaborate, but I think the most important thing about Valentine's Day is to treasure it. Let the person that you're with know that you care about them and you love them and that it is such a privilege to be with them on this Valentine's Day. So happy Valentine's Day, everybody. And again, I hope yours is the most wonderful, amazing, and non-discriminating Valentine's Day. And of course, the most loving. And I'll see you guys when? Yes, I will see you guys on the 17th. Take care, everyone. Be well.